we're looking at the tabernacle court and picturing God's place of reconciliation. During this whole series now, I have been covering reconciliation. We started off at the fence. You remember that went around the tabernacle and we, we saw the requirements for reconciliation that were in that fence. And then we looked at the gate and we saw that in this gate, by adding those four colors, God has given us himself, has fulfilled those requirements that the gate, that the fence set up for us to enter into his reconciliation. And now we're coming into the altar, the brazen altar, which is next, and we're going to be looking now at reconciliation as it actually happens. And <clears throat> there are two steps that I have said that I'm teaching to complete reconciliation to God. Let me make something clear here that everything was done here at the brazen altar. In other words, the brazen altar is a picture of the cross. Everything was done here at this brazen altar. All of the works that God needed to do to bring complete reconciliation between God and man was finished at the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, God's work was done. Complete reconciliation had been made. Don't get that out of your mind because you may be confused later when I say, you know, when I talk about us not being reconciled because God has got to bring this home to us now of what he has done. But all of the work was finished at Calvary. You see, he removed our sins by the death and by the blood of Jesus. He delivered us from who we are in a different manner. He did that by putting the old man of sin on the cross and crucifying that old man there with Jesus. There were two works that were done here. They were different works. One was with the blood, the other was with the cross. Don't get those two confused. In the first one, he delivered us from our sins. In the second one, he delivered us from who we are. God has pictured both of these in our baptism. Our baptism shows us that we died with him, that we were buried, that the old man was done away with, and that we arose now in newness of life to walk in a new resurrected life. The brazen altar now is a picture of the cross. And so I do not want to hurriedly rush through this most important vessel. All of the blessings of the Christian life come out of the cross. The brazen altar was the busiest place in the tabernacle. Very few things, if anything, was ever done in the tabernacle that did not somehow involve this altar. If they lit the lampstand, they came here for the fire. If they burned incense, they came here for the fire. Blood for the mercy seat came from off this altar. Everything we have in the Christian life comes from this altar or comes from the cross. So I do not want to hurry they rush by this today. In fact, I took time to prepare a PowerPoint presentation so you can more easily take notes. Last week I handed out this picture. If you don't have it in your manual, it's up here on the table. This is the altar, the brazen altar, pictured as it is about to travel. They covered it, first of all, with a purple cloth, and then they put this uh, badger skin covering over that, and then they carried it to, to the next place where they set up camp. All, 
every vessel in the tabernacle was covered with some cloth and some color. Purple is the color that was covered. And it's only, this is the only vessel that was covered in purple. And I mentioned this last week, but I want to go over it again. Because there were, this is what the kingly color. We, we just went over this last week, but I'm repeating. There were three signs on the cross. You remember that said, what did they say? That Jesus Christ is king in three different languages. We see this covered here in purple. We saw that the thief on the cross even looked at Jesus and said, and he saw beneath that badger skin covering of his humanity, he saw that purple, didn't he? Because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So this is a picture of Jesus Christ, the king, hanging on. When we see that purple draped over that altar, then we see Christ as king hanging upon that cross, don't we? It is a beautiful picture of the cross with our king, with the king of glory hanging, draped over it. Beautiful picture here that we have, a true picture of the cross standing in front of you right there. Last week we looked at this picture of reconciliation. It's a statue of reconciliation. Did anybody ever find out where that's from? Uh, somewhere in England. You know what, there's several of them. Were they? Yeah, there are like three or four of them. Oh, I didn't know. So I'm not sure which one that is. But anyhow, we looked at John 15 last week and we looked at what, what does reconciliation really look like. And this artist has expressed what re re reconciliation looks like to him. It is when both couples have their arm, both of these have their arms around each other in it, in an embrace. And then we went to John chapter 15. So let's get Jesus' picture of what reconciliation looked like. And it's you and me, he said, and me and you. And we looked at a graft. When you graft a limb or a branch onto a tree, the first thing that happens is that tree starts putting tentacles or or starts growing into that branch to bring that branch back to life. And then that branch, once it is brought back to life, it starts putting tentacles into the tree, right? And then it's, a, it's just an embrace, isn't it? So what we're talking about, each one now is embracing the other one in a complete reconciliation of the two. And Jesus pictured it as you and me and me and you. And this is that state of complete reconciliation. That is what reconciliation looks like. And Christ has done everything at the cross to effect that full reconciliation to God. Now I want you to look in your manuals and take out the sheet on the tabernacle. I want you to follow along with me just a second. It's the one on the front there of your book also. Have a book. Here's a couple of books here if y'all forgot y'all. Give that to me here. If you write in the uh, in your Bible, you may want to turn to Exodus chapter 25. Uh, you may want to make a note or two in, in here. If you have ever studied the tabernacle, you have noticed something very monotonous. Have you ever read through Exodus and, and, and what you find is that he tells Moses here in chapters 25, in the next three chapters, he tells Moses how to build the tabernacle. Then in, later on in chapters 37 over in there, he tells Moses, they start to build the tabernacle. And he repeats everything in those first three chapters about how to build the tabernacle. Then he repeats it over there. And instead of saying, build it like this, he says, and they built the tabernacle like this. But it's the same, almost the same thing. And so it, you wonder, why did he do that? Why didn't he say, just like I told you to build it, now build it? You know, we could have cut out three chapters there. 
And so I want to tell you this morning why I think that is, why he did it like this. It's a little complicated, so stay with me this morning. In chapter 25 of Exodus, God begins instructing Moses on how to build the tabernacle. You'll notice that in verses 10 through 22, he begins his instructions to Moses by telling him how to build the ark in the mercy seat. Then in verses 23 through 30, the table of presence. Then in verses 31 through 40 is the lampstand. Now the complete chapter of 26 is how to construct the tabernacle, the sanctuary itself. He tells how to do the coverings, the veil, the door, the walls, and everything about the sanctuary is in chapter 26. And then chapter 27 begins with the building of the brazen altar. And that's in verses 1 through 9. Then God completes it all with the construction of the court and the gate. Now chapter 20, if you want to make a note in your Bible, chapter 27 should actually end at verse 19. Because that completes the building of the tab of his instructions for building the tabernacle. Verse 20 should be really the first verse of chapter of the next chapter, 28, I guess. God is going <clears throat> to repeat these all of these instructions later on as doing them. But there are some notable differences between these two instructions. There's something that stands out in these first instructions through 27. Do you notice that where we started and where we ended? Where did we start? In the Holy of Holies with the ark first, right? Then we moved each vessel until we came out to the gate. Now this is picturing, first of all, what does God have to do? He has to make reconciliation, didn't he? And so he has to come out, and this is what Jesus did, didn't he? He came out of heaven and came out to that gate, and that gate, you remember, is the Gospels. We put that as the Gospels, the good news, the invitation to come in to be reconciled. And so we see God then first moves from the inside all the way out to the outside to the gate. Now we're going to see that in these next in instructions, it is not God going out, but he has made a way, he is making a way now for us to come in. And so in the first instructions to Moses, he's telling how he's going out. And then in those next, when they actually build the tabernacle, it's going to be a way for us to go in. And we're going to see those differences. I'm, on, I'm going to look at some of them this morning. This is a good study if you want to go into this study, your own self. <clears throat> You'll notice something very strange about what I just told you. What vessel is missing in these instructions? Labor. The labor. He left the labor out. Did he forget it? <laughs> I don't think so either. 